Good evening. Let's open our Bibles tonight to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Before we look into God's Word and read His Word together, let's bow in prayer and keeping in mind that God the Holy Spirit is the teacher. Uh, we have in uh, it's, uh, 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse, around verse 14, it talks about the Holy Spirit ministers and teaches our human spirit spiritual things, spiritual truth. And so, when we are neither grieving nor quenching God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit has the liberty to minister truth in our hearts. And this is very important because we can, uh, because God's Word is unique, uh, it is only God the Holy Spirit who can minister the truths to us that we really need to have and absorb. So let's take a moment, consider that as we uh, pray together and thank God for the provision that He has made in 1 John 1, nine through His Son Jesus Christ. He said, if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And in that way, uh, we are forgiven, cleansed of unrighteousness, and God the Holy Spirit can freely minister in our hearts. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we... Thank you for this opportunity to assemble tonight as the body of Christ. We thank you for the time we've had in singing hymns and the many wonderful thoughts and biblical truths that came to our mind as we sing tonight, uh, all to your honor and glory. And Father, now as we open your living word, we pray, Father, as we're rightly related uh, to you in the spirit, Father, that your Spirit would minister the truth to us that we need. We, Father, are greatly thankful that You know each individual here tonight. You know each individual's needs. And Father, You can minister personally, taking the truths of Your Word and minister to each one of us exactly as we need. And so, Father, we look forward to and anticipate a blessing in Your Word tonight as we look into uh, the letter of Jesus Christ to the church of Smyrna. We thank You for all of these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read together once again. Uh, we began this letter last week. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Keep in mind that Jesus Christ wrote this letter uh, to a specific church, the church that was located in Smyrna. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which are uh, any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, as we did with the, the letter to the church of Ephesus, I would like you, if we finish tonight, if, that's, a, that's maybe a big if, but if we finish this letter tonight, I would like to, at the end, open it up to, what did you learn in Christ's letter to the church of Smyrna? We are the church. We all should be very extremely attentive 
to what Christ is saying to these churches so that we can adjust in our individual lives, we can adjust corporately as a church so that we might be the church that God wants us to be. So That's all right. So I would like all of you to really consider uh, this letter to the church. And hopefully we will have time in the end if I don't stop rattling on. All right. Uh, we made it last week down to uh, at the. We finished the first phrase in verse nine, but I'd like to back up and just say, in regards to verse eight, um, every time that Christ is described in these seven letters, uh, it is said to be pertinent to the needs of the church, and I can very clearly see that this is true here, because you have a church that is experiencing has experienced and is about to experience a more intensified suffering. And Christ says to them, I am the first and the last. I was dead and I came to life. And that is a great encouragement for them because they are realizing that Jesus Christ is eternal life. They are realizing that they too, because He rose, they too will rise and they will live with the Lord Jesus Christ eternally. And so, this is uh, the, the way he opens up. And then he says in the first phrase, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And that is, uh, the word no is oida, and it means I fully know. Your works, I know fully. Your tribulation, I know fully. Your poverty. And we saw that that word meant that they were absolutely destitute. They were dirt poor as a people. And for a reason, because probably as we have seen in America even today, and we'll get into this a little bit more as we go on, because of their faith in Jesus Christ in the region they were living in, they were uh, many times dragged into prison court for political disloyalty. You have sinned against, as it were, Caesar. And they were even... um, if they were demanded, they would have to even say, Caesar is Lord. And of course, many of them wouldn't do that. And so, many of them probably lost property. They lost uh, their businesses, as we see happening even in America today, uh, for what, it, what are called hate crimes. For speaking the truth in love concerning certain things that the government has put a stamp of approval on, such as homosexuality. And if you speak up against that uh, in any fashion, or will not go along with it, like some of the bakeries or restaurants or pizza shops and so forth, you could suffer uh, government penalties and actually basically lose your entire livelihood. That's already happening here. This is some of what was happening in the church in Smyrna. Now we're going to open up tonight with the phrase uh, 9b. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Most likely, it was the local Jewish synagogue or synagogues that were called the synagogue of Satan by Christ Himself. As was evident throughout the book of Acts, most of the persecution that the early church faced was from what group of people? The Jews. The Jews. The religious Jews especially led the charge against Christians. The blasphemy 
here in verse 9 was directed toward the believers, the reviling, the slander of the saints. We saw an example of it in Acts 13.34. It says, and Paul was in Antioch, Pisidia, and he he gave uh, a message one uh, Sabbath, and the synagogue had the normal number of people. Well, guess what happened the next Sabbath? The place was filled. It says the entire city turned out to hear Paul. And the Jews, whoo, when they saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming Paul, they opposed all the things spoken by Paul. Now, in the city, in a city such as Smyrna, this will give you a little bit more background to help understand what these people are going through. In a city such as Smyrna, with its strong ties to Rome, False charges laid before the magistrates could easily have resulted in imprisonment for those accused, quote, by Mounts. Such Jewish agitation against Paul in other cities is well documented at Antioch and Pisidia. We, uh, ju I just quoted 1345 and 1350 talks about uh, they raised up persecution against Paul such that they were expelled from the city. During the first century, six types of slander were leveled against Christians. Cannibalism, that, that's amazing, but anyway. Cannibalism, lust and immorality, breaking up homes, atheism, political disloyalty, and cinderiasm. That means a troublemaker probably the one capitalized upon most in Rome-oriented Smyrna was that of political disloyalty. Because you can recall, and we do recall, that Smyrna was the capital of emperor worship. And so everyone worshipped Caesar. And anyone that didn't go along with that was in trouble. Further passages on Jewish persecutions of Christians. Uh, well, Acts 13.50 was just mentioned in the quote. Acts 14.2, Acts 14.5 and verse 19. Acts 17.5, 26.2 and 1 Thessalonians 2.14 and 15. So it's well documented and that's only a, a scratching the surface that the Jews... A Jewish persecution was strong against Christians. Now, when we think of this type of Jew, we think of the words of Jesus when He said, Not all Israel is Israel. Let's go to Romans 9. If you would, turn back to Romans chapter 9 and we'll read verses 6 through 8. <clears throat> of course, the Apostle Paul is writing here. Romans 9, verse, beginning in verse 6. But it is not that the Word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. And that phrase, the children of promise, the promise is tied into the gospel, and they are the children of the gospel in a sense. You could say, these are true sons. These are true Israel. Now, those who were not inwardly of Abraham are of another father. 
Let's go back to John. This is Jesus' encounter with the religious leaders. John chapter 8, the Gospel of John. Chapter 8. This really nails it. This really shows us where these people are coming from. These Jews who are who are of the synagogue of Satan, what's their problem? Jesus nailed it. This is their problem. Let's begin reading in John 8 verse 37. Jesus is speaking. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love Me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of Myself, but He sent Me. Why do you not understand My speech? Because you are not able to listen to My Word. You are of your Father, the devil and the desires of your father you want to do he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaks a lie he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it but because I tell the truth you do not believe me Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear, because you are not of God. We'll stop our reading there. So you see, Jesus has very clearly, had very clearly laid this out to them. And we are not very far removed from this time period when Jesus spoke, I will, I'm going to roughly say, 60 years. These people are still alive, and I don't want to say alive and well, these people are still on target against Christians. And Jesus nailed the key as to why they are like that. Now, these Jews were unbelievers. But religious, even Christians can get religious on you and can become in opposition to truth and in opposition uh, to other believers. And... I just recall, and I would like to turn there, turn back to Numbers 16. This is the famous account of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in Numbers 16. And here we have these believers who are kind of... Uh, full of themselves. And Korah, with with 250 plus other people, approach Moses and Aaron. And 
verse 3, uh, if you read verse 2, you see that he has 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. Oh, wow. And they gathered together against Moses and Aaron in verse 3 and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? In essence, Chorus says, why do you exalt yourself above us? The Lord is with us. The Lord is among us. Now, jump ahead to verse 28. Time of testing. And Moses said, by this, he's speaking to these very same people, speaking to Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them on my own, of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But, if the Lord creates a new thing, in other words, this hasn't happened before. If the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected who? The Lord. Moses says, you'll know then that they rejected Me. No. He makes it very personal with the Lord. They have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, as he, Moses, finished speaking all these words, that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly." Now, if we were to read on, not only we, will, we would see that not only these three families died, but also the 250 men who offered incense. And then, then, because the people grumbled as if it was Moses' fault that these 250 and these three families died, the Lord was, I would say, Ticked off. And 14,700 died in protest against Moses and Aaron, saying that they had killed the people of the Lord. Well, going now back to Revelation 2. By the very words of Christ, this class of Jews that are persecuting the church of Smyrna are not Jews in the truest sense as we saw, but they are actually a synagogue, a congregation of Satan. And you see where Christ comes up with this term now. They are an assembly of Satan. They are a congregation of Satan because they are of their father, the devil. They are being used by Satan, these Jews. They're being used by Satan. Because of their rejection of the Gospel of Christ, they have availed themselves to be used by Satan. Now, as practical application for us, 
we don't want to forget as believers that when you and I, when I say no to God, no, I'm not going to do that. Yes, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but I don't care. I'm going to keep on doing it. When I say no to God, I'm saying yes to Satan. When I say no to God, when I know the right thing to do and I say, no, I'm not going to do that, I am opening myself up to Satan. I put forward to you that this is very, very serious. The Scriptures say that even believers can be can be taken captive by Satan to do his will. I did not say demon possessed. So that it, so that it is not my words, let's turn to 1 Timothy 3:7. 1 It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Those were words spoken to believers. First Timothy three seven. Moreover, he referring to elders, moreover he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. The snare of who? The snare of the devil. He fall into the snare of the devil. Let's turn to Second Timothy chapter two, beginning in verse twenty four. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. One more, Second Timothy, Second Peter 2.18 You see, it's not a joking matter to be openly knowledge in, in open knowledge to disobey the Lord. Second Peter two eighteen. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. And so, we must be sober-minded about this because Satan would love nothing more than to have you under His sway through disobedience to the Lord. Satan is mentioned in four out of the seven letters to the churches. Four out of seven Satan is mentioned. Where do you think that Satan is busy today? He's busy in the church. We'll talk a little bit more about that in in a few minutes. Churches that are teaching truth and being the light are the churches 
who will be under attack. The churches who already, by Jesus Christ, have already had their lampstand taken away. They're dead. There's no light emanating from their church. Satan doesn't have to bother. But the church that is vibrant, living for the Lord, witnessing, teaching, grounding, equipping, the being the light, there's a big target on their backs. Note the words of encouragement now that we're back in Revelation 2. Note the words of encouragement that we see here in this letter. A church that has suffered. A church that is about to suffer even more. Even to a level that reaches martyrdom. History tells us that Polycarp is one of the famous martyrs, probably a, the bishop, probably a leader in the church of Smyrna. And he was martyred. So this church was in need of encouragement. And, and the Lord always knows when we need encouragement. He comes along and gives us encouragement Note right here in our context, he says to them, do not fear. He encourages them to, to be faithful. He says, I will give you the crown of life and you shall not be hurt by the second death. There's a lot of encouragement and I didn't even put in there verse 8 the encouragement that I am the Eternal One. I am not going away. And You will be with Me. Christ wanted them to have courage. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. This is, do not fear is a present imperative. Present tense means, continuously do not fear. Imperative is, the imperative is uh, command with the negative. And when you have that Greek construction, it actually means instead of saying do not fear, it actually can be stated in English, stop fearing. A command of the Lord. Stop fearing those things which you are about to suffer. Though suffering was looming on the horizon, Christ did not want them to live under fear. We're reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 1.7, For the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. The Lord hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And yet, how often do we fear? I'll be the first one to raise my hand. When I have problems, I will tend to fear about, whoa, what's going to happen? How's this going to work out? Oh, and it... And you fear these things. The Lord doesn't want us to live under a cloud of fear. Why? Because He's able. That's why. Because He's able. Practically speaking, how do we stop fearing? If you are a fearer, or you have a tendency to live under a cloud of fear often, how do we stop? Well, we stop by start, starting to trust and pray. Now, we're not going to look all these verses up, but I do want to, I do want to mention them. 
You know in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the Apostle Paul said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, bring your request to God. And the peace of God shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 4:14 4, through 16, my new favorite, that because Jesus Christ is our great high priest and he can sympathize with our weaknesses because he took on flesh, he knows how we feel. It says, therefore, because of that, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may Find great, we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, wow. These are powerful verses. 2 Corinthians 12 is when Paul said, Lord, take this thorn in my flesh away from me. Three times he asked the Lord, take this away. And Jesus said to him, My grace is sufficient for you. For my Strength, Jesus said, for my strength is made complete in weakness. And the words that follow by the Apostle Paul indicate this. That Paul got and understood every word of that. Because he said, oh, may I be weak. May I be weak. So God's strength will be full in my life. And boy, we have to get out of God's way. We ought to get out of God's way more so that His strength would be full. How about Isaiah 26, 3 and 4? Thou wilt keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because He trusts in thee. Trust in the Lord God, for in the Lord God is everlasting strength. Trust in the Lord God. Why? Because He is everlasting strength. How about Isaiah 40? But they that wait upon the Lord, that word wait means to fully just trust. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How about James 1.5? If you lack wisdom, ask God for wisdom. And He will give you wisdom every time. Ask in faith. How about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. So how do we stop fearing if we have a fear pattern in our life? We claim the truth of God's Word and believe it. Hebrews, uh, Romans chapter 4 And Abraham did not waver at the promises of God, but he fully was assured that God could accomplish everything that He promised. You ought to read that, Romans 4. That's a precious... That's verses 20 and 21. Read that whole section there. It's very precious. All right. And here, getting back now mentally... The church, for the church of Smyrna, we want to note one thing. Christ, this is a very important point. For the church in Smyrna, Christ did not promise that He would deliver them from all this suffering. But He did point them to look beyond the suffering by faith and hold on to the promise Two specific promises that He had given them. Hold on, church. Hold on, Smyrna. And I will give you the crown of life. Hold on, Smyrna. Because you're going to live with Me for all eternity. You see what Jesus does here? They're embroiled in this Fear. He had to tell them, stop fearing the suffering that you are about to encounter. Stop. Don't fear. If you stick it out with Me, 
by faith, I will give you the crown of life. And just remember one thing. This life is just temporary. You're going to live with Me for all eternity. So live for Me. And I'll tell you what, that's a very important point for the Christian way of life, for endurance in the Christian way of life. Whenever we start to get buried, buried in our problems and in the circumstances that loom over our heads, and some of it can be very, very heavy, the Lord says, look up. Don't look at everything around you. Look up. Think of that day that you'll be with Me. Live for Me now. Trust Me. Walk with Me. Live by faith. Endure. And you will be rewarded and you will live with Me for all eternity. I believe this is very timely. This message. Now concerning what you are about to suffer, as I was thinking of this, here you have a church, Smyrna. Was there any rebuke at all from the Lord? Zero. No rebuke at all. As far as we know, Smyrna was doing everything God wanted them to do as a church. And look where they're at. So you ask yourself, you know, I can understand when the God, the ungodly suffer, they deserve it. But I don't understand. Why would the godly suffer? The church of Smyrna was a godly church. They were a godly people. Why are they suffering? The Scriptures give a number of reasons. And I took this from the Bible Knowledge Commentary just because it was uh, neat and compact. Suffering, you and I may encounter suffering for very, four different reasons. Number one, because we're being disciplined by the Lord. We're not going to look these up. It take too much time. But 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about the Lord's table. Remember it said, because some people were taking the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, He said, some among you are weak, sick, and some are asleep. Meaning they died. Discipline. Hebrews 12, around verse 5 and forward, Why do we suffer sometimes? Because the Lord disciplines us with the purpose that in the end, the peaceable fruit of righteousness will be produced in our lives. Praise God, He spanks me. Praise God, He spanks you. Praise God that He turns my head around when it gets turned the wrong way. So, sometimes we suffer because We need to be disciplined by the Lord. Second, sometimes it's preventive. We've already talked about Paul's thorn in the flesh. By the way, why did he have that thorn in the flesh? Because he had seen and heard things that had God not humbled him through whatever this thorn in the flesh was, his head would have been so big he wouldn't have been able to get in any doors. He would have been so arrogant and so proud because God enabled him to see things that no man had ever seen and heard. So He gave him this thorn in the flesh just as preventive maintenance. Keep him keep him humble. Number three, the learning of obedience as Christ's suffering. We read this verse last week, if you recall, Hebrews 5.8. It says that the Lord Jesus... This is amazing. The Lord Jesus learned obedience through the things that He suffered. If you don't believe it, look it up. Hebrews 5.8 It's a great verse. Meditate on that. 
That was Jesus in his humanity, of course, the God-man. And then fourth, the providing of a better testimony for Christ. Acts 9.16, this is the words of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, speaking to the Apostle Paul. He says, he must, he must uh, how's it go, suffer uh, for my sake. In other words, the, I, I'm messing the, the words up there, but um, Paul suffered for the sake of Jesus Christ. All right, so that's some of why we suffer as believers. Undeserved suffering, all of them, except number one. And sometimes you and I will deserve, will go through undeserved suffering. Peter writes a lot about suffering, first and second Peter, uh, which you can uh, read about there. So Christ forewarns them back in Revelation 2 that they are about to suffer. And now He's going to tell them the form of the suffering. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Some of you. Interesting. Some of you are going to be... Some of you in this church are going to be thrown into prison. Christ is essentially telling the church of Smyrna. And I thought about this and and as I was I I was thinking God tries and when I say tries I mean like He puts us through trials. God tries each of us according to His will and our needs. The way I am tried may not be the way that you are tried by the Lord. But be guaranteed that in order for your faith to grow, God will be faithful to try you. Its trials are necessary and for our good. And the verses that you can look up on this, I'm giving you plenty of verses tonight. I hope if you're writing them down, this week, this would be a good study material for you. Trials are necessary for the refining of your faith. You will grow spiritually. You will grow in endurance. You will grow in patience. First Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. First Peter 4.12. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 2 through 4. 2 Timothy 3.12, James 1.2-4, and Psalm 66, verses 10-12. through 12. In the last sentence, through times of suffering, we must always remember 1 Corinthians 1.13. That He will never test you above what you're able but He will with the temptation also make a way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. That's our God. He knows you inside and outside. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what I need. He knows best how to try me. And when I look to Him in the trial, I can confidently say, Lord, I know You are going to make a way of escape for me. Now, He's not going to take me around the trial. The escape comes through the middle of the trial, but He always makes a way of escape that I will be able to bear it, endure it. That's our God. Praise Him. Hmm. Now, we're, I think, um, we're a couple minutes over time, and I think that we will stop here just because we're going to get into talking about uh, more on suffering. 
and I could never finish this section. So next week, unfortunately, will have to be uh, the the ending of the letter to Smyrna and probably starting the next letter to Pergamos. But I will challenge you this week to do two things. Number one, study those verses that uh, you, uh, you had there tonight. Two, reread the letter to Smyrna. Anticipate what's going to be taught next week in the in the final parts of verses 10 and 11. And then re-meditate on the letter to the church of Smyrna and come up with either encouragements, something you learned, or uh, something that challenged you, or any any thoughts on the letter of Christ to the church of Smyrna, and then read uh, begin uh, reading the letter of Pergamos, and uh, you can't read it too many times. And uh, as as I would encourage you, I would say um, have a have a little notebook or a piece of paper alongside while you're reading it, and just jot down observations as you read any of these letters. This reading the Bible is not for speed reading, you know, so I can say, I read four chapters. Praise the Lord. What did you get out of it? Nothing. <clears throat> so read to, you know, make observations. You all heard the story about Howard Hendricks in his when he was teaching at Dallas. He uh, one day brought in a a fish. I presume it was gutted, but it was a, a fish, and he and he just plopped it on the table in front of all the students. And he proceeded to say, "Now, in the next uh, five minutes, I want you to uh, make 15 observations about this fish, and you can come up and look at it a little more closely if you need to, and so on and so forth." And then when they finished, he said, "Okay, now." Um, I want you to make 15 more observations in the next five minutes. And this, you get the point, this continued on and he said, for homework tonight, I want you to make 15 more observations on. And and so what it taught the students was to continue, keep looking at this letter to the church of Smyrna. Look at it and make observations and then look at it again and make more observations. It does you no good if I'm the only one making the observations and you, and I'm getting some things out of it and you're getting nothing out of it per se. You invest yourself into the Scriptures and really start doing this, making some observations and studying the Bible in this manner. It, it doesn't take a, a, a seminary degree to make observations from Scripture. That's for sure. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank You for this time in Your Holy Word. It truly is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, Father. And I uh, know, Father, that uh, Your Holy Word can have a mighty effective work in our lives, Father. And I'm sure the Spirit of God, Your Spirit, has ministered this evening uh, to our hearts as we looked at various different scriptures. And I pray specifically because we are the church of 2016. Father, I pray that as we read this letter and the other letters, that we would evaluate ourselves as a church in light of what Jesus Christ had to say to these seven churches. May we uh, learn, Father, And most importantly, may we change if we see anywhere where we need to change individually or corporately, Father. May we do so. That we would be the spiritual house You've called us to be. The administration that is working effectively for You. And We pray all these things now. Father, And we want to thank You for the fellowship to follow. We want to thank You for the food that's been provided and the hands that have prepared it for us. In Jesus' name, amen.